Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, as he said, my name is Calvin, and I'll be talking to you about uh, type inference error explanation. So a lot of languages have support for some kind of type inference. Uh, this is a snippet of code from OCaml, which is a language where you don't have to write any types, even though it is strictly statically typed. All the types are inferred by the compiler. And this piece of code comes from a uh, data set of student written programs. We've simplified it a little bit for clarity, and it has a type error in it. The student included this uh, print string call as part of a debugging effort as they were implementing this function. Print string in OCaml is a function that takes a string and returns a value of type unit. And this is actually the source of the problem. Because in OCaml, uh, if is not just a statement, it's an expression. And so this print string call needs to have the same type as this accumulator variable that shows up in the other branch of the if. And of course, this accumulator variable comes from this argument passed to the function. And this argument is given a value of type list. So you can see that this uh, value of type unit, which is this print string call, is connected to this list on the other end, and there's a type conflict. And the unfortunate thing is that this sort of problem is really hard to diagnose, and compilers get this wrong all the time. So if you actually give this example to the OCaml compiler, it'll point at this uh, list expression and tell you some uh, error message about it. Uh, the error message is a little difficult to read, but the point here is that it got the location wrong. Um, the true source of the error is that print string call for debugging purposes and not this argument. This is actually a correct call to the loop function down below. In this example, where all of the code is sort of compressed and close together, it can be a little hard to see why this would be a problem. But in the real world, this definition of the function may actually be way far up in the file, and the compiler pointed to something that's very far away from the true source of the error. This is a difficult problem to solve, but fortunately, there's good news. Uh, there have been some recent advances that give us hope that we can actually address this problem. The compilers can give us good error messages. So in 2014, uh, Zhang and Myers presented a tool that found far fewer missed error locations on OCaml programs than the OCaml compiler. And that same year, uh, Zvonimir Pavlinovich also showed that we can produce error reports that are guaranteed to be minimal. They explain all of the type errors in the code with the smallest number of messages to the user, which is a great property to have. And both of these approaches were specialized to OCaml. And uh, going forward, I'm going to be referring to them by the names of the tools, which are uh, Sherlock for the first one and uh, min -er -lock, mi Minlock for the second one. Uh, and what we were interested in is could we use those approaches on a new language for a new compiler? So this is a snippet of JavaScript. And uh, if you attended Cole's talk on Wednesday, you may have heard that Samsung has been working on a static compiler for a typed subset of JavaScript. So this is legal JavaScript code, uh, but it is not legal in their typed subset because this call to go here on this line uh, is missing an argument. And you need to supply every argument in this type system. So we want to know. Can we have the same great error explanation for this JavaScript type system that these previous approaches have managed to produce for OCaml? So in this talk, I'm going to tell you about these previous approaches and how exactly it is that they work. Then I'm going to show you our framework, which generalizes these into a language agnostic framework. And we get a lot of improved performance, actually, as a result of doing this, which might be surprising. And finally, I'm going to show you an evaluation where we look at the error report quality of these previous approaches against our technique, uh, and we evaluate our performance relative to theirs. So let's dive right in. Uh, if you have an existing compiler and you want to do some kind of type error explanation, your architecture is going to look a little like this. Uh, you parse the program input, you send it off to your type inference algorithm, and if it succeeds, it passes those types down to the back end of the program where you generate code and you uh, produce your final output. And if it fails, uh, a common thing to do here is to simply throw an exception and show it to the user, which is bad. So what these, what these other approaches do is actually you do something different. You convert your type inference problem into a system of constraints. The constraint language is fixed for each of these tools. They each have a different one. But if you can convert your problem into a system of constraints that's equivalent, uh, then these tools pass it off to a black box solver that finds a correcting set. 
a set of these constraints that if they weren't there, everything would type check and everything would be fine. Given this correcting set, it's up to you, the compiler writer, to lift their solution back up into meaningful types for the programmer and produce an error report. And this entire architecture is a little bit strange, especially if your type inference algorithm, as many are, is already architected as a constraint generator and a constraint solver. You wind up uh, with this mismatch where you have to convert your constraints into this tool's constraints. You have to deal with the possibly poor performance of this uh, correcting set solver. And indeed, uh, on very small real world examples, these tools can take half an hour or run out of heap space and simply never complete. Uh, and this all seems very silly because you're duplicating all of the work of implementing your type inference algorithm just for a different framework and a different tool. And we'd like to avoid all of this uh, duplicated work, all of these performance problems, and this mismatch between the two constraint systems. So from this diagram, the thing we really care about is this bit that finds the correcting set, that figures out where are the points in the program you need to change in order to make it type check. So let's look at uh, what this looks like. If you have this JavaScript snippet that I showed you from earlier, uh, it implies a set of constraints about the types involved. So from the definition of this function go, you might learn that it takes one argument. From the second call site, you learn that it's required that Go takes no arguments. And you can see that there's already a conflict here. From this next call site, we learn again that Go takes one argument. And furthermore, that argument has to be an integer. A correcting set is going to be this constraint here. This constraint, if it wasn't present, everything would type check fine. And you would learn that Go is a function that takes one argument, which is an integer. Uh, and this has a really natural translation into an error report for the user. So the constraint corresponds to a location in the syntax tree. And if that constraint isn't there, we know what the type of Go should be, and we can report why there's a conflict. Specifically, Go is missing an argument on this line. And correcting sets aren't anything magical. They're actually not hard to compute. Uh, here is a silly algorithm for doing it. Uh, you can use brute force search. Here are all of the constraints. All you have to do is enumerate all of the possible correcting sets. There they are. I've omitted some because there's a lot of them. Uh, and then you send off the constraints minus each correcting set to the type solver and see if it is indeed a true correcting set. And if you do that, you find that uh, the set consisting of just constraint two is a correcting set. It's the smallest possible one because you enumerated them in order of size. And everything is wonderful. So you found the correcting set. The problem is that this is an exponential size list. There are two to the n uh, possible subsets for n constraints. And we'd really like to avoid this kind of trouble. So the constraint solving community has actually given us a much better algorithm for doing this, uh, which is based on what's called an unsatisfiable core. So given these set of constraints, an unsatisfiable core is a subset which is on its own unsatisfiable. So for instance, this is an unsatisfiable core, which I pointed out earlier. If you ignore all the other constraints in the system and reduce your search to just these two, these alone do not work. So given this unsatisfiable core, you might guess at a correcting set. You might say, well, uh, this looks like a correcting set. If we remove it, then this unsatisfiable core is now, uh, it type checks. Go is a function with no arguments. And if you send this off to the type solver, maybe you get back a new unsatisfiable core. These two constraints in isolation are unsatisfiable, even if you drop constraint one. So you update your guess, and now you've found an actual correcting set, and everything is wonderful. And you can do this on large constraint systems with far fewer iterations than the brute force search solution takes. So the overall algorithm for doing this is quite simple. Until everything type checks, find an unsat core, uh, guess at a correcting set, and repeat. And these previous approaches I described earlier, the reason that they require you to convert your problem into their constraint system is for this middle line, in order to find unsatisfiable cores. And we realized that you actually don't need to do this. This approach is applicable to any solver if you can modify that solver to produce unsatisfiable cores directly. So if you can make this change, then our uh, crazy architecture diagram here for how everything works gets a whole lot simpler. You adjust your solver to produce unsatisfiable cores. 
And all these other steps go away, and you arrive at our framework. Uh, we called it Mycroft, uh, after the brother of Sherlock Holmes. And uh, you don't you get a lot of benefits from doing things this way. So in particular, you get equivalent quality error reports because the core algorithm for finding correcting sets can be exactly the same. Uh, you get a very low implementation overhead. You don't need to do as much work converting your problem into an alternate constraint system, lifting the solution back up. And you get greatly improved performance because you can leverage all of the domain-specific optimizations that you put in your existing solver, and you don't need to trust this hairy exponential time black box thing. So let's look at how you actually do this little uh, wrench here. How do you actually adjust an existing solver to produce unsatisfiable cores? Uh, typically, the way that these constraint solvers work is they examine each constraint and they learn something about the variables involved from each one. So in this case, we have these four constraints over this uh, function Go. So there are four constraints and one variable. And if we look at the first constraint, we learn that Go has to be a function that takes one argument. Uh, and in a typical solver, you just move on to the second constraint after doing this. But all you have to do to produce an unsat core at the end is remember why you learned this fact about Go. So we'll just annotate that this came from constraint one. When you visit the second constraint, you can see that there's a conflict. The second constraint says that Go takes no arguments, but we learned that it has to take one. So we can construct an unsatisfiable core out of the constraint we're currently considering and the set of constraints that contributed to the type of Go. And you might be worried about this because this seems like a pretty invasive change you have to make to the solver in order to track uh, which constraints uh, caused different type assignments, but it's actually not so bad. So we did this for two different uh, type inference solvers, one for OCaml uh, and one for JavaScript. And in both cases, we had to add about 5% uh, extra lines on top of the existing source code and change a few, uh, but this is actually quite a small amount of effort compared to the initial effort to implement the thing in the first place, and there's sort of a principled way in which you can do this. So it's really not so bad. And if you do this, there's a lot of benefit. Once you have a solver that produces unsatisfiable cores, you have to address the next thing, which is how do we go from a set of unsatisfiable cores to a correcting set? Essentially, what you do at each iteration of the algorithm is you guess at a correcting set. The requirement being that it just has to cover at least one constraint from each unsatisfiable core if you hope to make the system satisfiable. And uh, our framework is actually agnostic to the algorithm you pick here. You can plug in your favorite. So Sherlock uses a very complicated and very intelligent algorithm based on Bayesian reasoning. Uh, so it's very well reasoned. It produces great error reports. Uh, it is a little bit tied to the OCaml type system in particular. It's difficult to generalize this to other languages. Uh, and it requires exponential time, which is also a bit of a downside. Uh, Minlock uses an approach based on a reduction to maximum satisfiability. You can actually formulate this problem as a maxSat problem, send it off to an off-the-shelf maxSat solver, and get back a minimal correcting set. Uh, so guaranteed to be minimal, language agnostic, which is wonderful, and again, unfortunately, exponential time. We're going to add one more uh, box to this list just to give you options. So we propose a greedy algorithm. The greedy algorithm is not guaranteed to be minimal, but there is a nice approximation. You can make a guarantee about how close to the minimal error report you get. Uh, it is language agnostic, and it's very fast, polynomial time, or linear in a typical case. Uh, because Sherlock's algorithm is somewhat tied to OCaml and it's not language agnostic, we didn't implement it in our framework. We support these two. However, I am going to evaluate against uh, the Sherlock tool and show you how our, our error reports compare to theirs. So let's dive into the evaluation. What we're interested in is, can our algorithm produce error reports of comparable quality to previous work? We believe this to be true because uh, the algorithm for finding a correcting set is very similar. Uh, what's the performance of this approach relative to previous work? I told you that we get to avoid this exponential time uh, blow up in the underlying solver uh, if you can modify your solver to produce unsatisfiable cores, and I'll show that this is indeed the case. We get greatly improved performance. Uh, and I said that we support these two explanation strategies based on maximum satisfiability or greedy approximation. So 
you might be interested in whether which of these you actually want to implement in your compiler. So the we'll be evaluating against these previous works on uh, OCaml, and we'll be using a data set that's actually common in this domain. So this was collected in 2007 by Benjamin Lerner and others, uh, and it consists of student-written uh, OCaml programs. So as the students would work on their homework for a class, they actually were using a modified compiler that every time they compiled their code, whether it compiled correctly or not, would send a copy to the researchers. So we actually have every single intermediate state that these students went through as they were developing their code. Every time they believed it to be correct and sent it to the type checker. Uh, so this is a great data set. And we can look at, because we have all of the intermediate states, we know sort of what the right fixes are for each program. And we can use that to evaluate the quality of these approaches. So we're going to look at the quality in terms of precision and recall. Uh, I always get these a little confused, so I've included a blurb that helps you understand what's going on here. Precision, which is what this graph shows for these four approaches, is out of the uh, error locations that the tools reported, how many of those were correct? So our tool scored 75%, which means that if we tell you four error locations, in a typical case, one of those will not be a true error that's meaningful to you. Only three of them will be. And as you can see, the tools all score more or less the same. So this is the OCaml compiler on the far left, Sherlock and Minlock in the middle, and uh, our algorithm with the max sat strategy over on the right. Uh, recall tells a pretty different story, actually. So recall is, out of the true loca error locations that exist in each file, how many did the tools successfully find? So you can see that the OCaml compiler scores abysmally on this metric. This is due to two reasons. First, the OCaml compiler can only report one error message each time you run it. This means that if there are multiple type errors in your file, you only have hope of recovering one of them at most. Uh, and second, the OCaml compiler doesn't have a well-principled heuristic for where to report the error. It reports the error at essentially the lowest possible line in the file when the type conflict is discovered. Uh, and this is actually not a great heuristic in a lot of cases. Uh, Sherlock, we believe, would score higher on this metric, except that they have a similar problem to the OCaml compiler. As soon as Sherlock can prove that there is a type error in the set of constraints, it stops generating constraints. So if there are multiple unrelated type errors that show up later in the file, you miss those. That's not necessarily a strong attribute of their technique. It just happens to be an implementation detail that we weren't able to work around. Uh, Minlock is a bit closer to the results we achieve, so uh, the gap there is a little confusing because these algorithms are essentially the same. So the reason that we get slightly better explanation than them is because the constraint system that we use is exactly designed for OCaml. Minlock actually reduces the constraints to SMT, which means that they need a lot of SMT constraints that encode properties of the type system rather than uh, having this nice one-to-one -one correspondence between constraints and error reports. And so they get a slightly worse score than us, and we actually get improved uh, error quality here just because our constraint system is better suited to the task of error explanation. Uh, we also do a lot better on performance. So uh, this graph shows uh, time on a log scale on the x-axis. And for each tool out of 32 of these files from the seminal data set, uh, how many can you actually find an error report for in that amount of time? Uh, so as you can see, OCaml can produce an error report for every single one of these files in less than a second. And our tool can as well, actually, even with the max sat approach, because we don't need to spend as much time finding, uh, finding a correcting set. The other two approaches actually spin out very fast. So we had a timeout of three minutes for this experiment. And just on these 32 files, you already get uh, very close to that timeout. And there are definitely a lot of files in this data set where these two lines go way off the rails. And you wind up waiting half an hour or uh, an infinite amount of time for your results to come back. Uh, you might also wonder, how large are these files that are causing these tools to spin out? They're very small. None of these have more than 100 lines of code in them. They're student assignments. They're pretty small. Uh, but this is actually pretty unrealistic. So in the real world, uh, 
programs can be a lot bigger. So we have this uh, experiment where we introduced artificial type errors in programs of increasing size. Um, and as you can see, at about 400 lines of code, these previous approaches spin out and can't do anything. Uh, whereas we stay competitive with the existing OCaml compiler, even up to 1,300 lines of code. Uh, finally, if you throw the maximum satisfiability and greedy algorithms together in a box and you compare them, uh, you actually get comparable localization quality. This approximation factor that the greedy algorithm gives you is really quite nice. And so your error reports are very similar in both cases. But with greedy algorithm, you can get much, much better performance. So as the number of distinct type errors in the file increases, MaxSat will take longer and longer to recover all of them on each iteration, whereas the greedy algorithm can do it very, very quickly. Um, and of course, this doesn't just work for OCaml. Uh, this algorithm actually does work for JavaScript as well for Sam with Samsung's uh, JavaScript compiler, and it produces exactly the error message you'd want, which is great. So with that, uh, I've presented our framework for doing type inference error explanation in a performant and language agnostic way, and I would open the floor to questions.